Good morning, um, let's see, Health Education and Human Services Committee members. Uh, who I see are, is um, Delegate Paul Begay on the line? Are there any other members from the Health Education and Human Services Committee on the line?
Good morning, Ms. Finale. Are we on? Good morning, Delegate Halona. We're waiting for a quorum at this time. Okay, thank you. Uh, good morning, and I'll, I'll stand by. Thank you. Delegate Daniel So is on the call. Good morning, Chair So. Uh, so far, we have yourself, um, Delegate um, Paul Vigay, and Delegate Pernell Holona. Uh, we're, we still need um, one more for a quorum. Thank you. Hey guys. Karen did tell me it was a meeting. Delegate Wanika is here. Chair So, um, Delegate Wanika is um, attending in person in the BNF conference room. There are four members on the call. Okay. Um, committee members. Uh, before, uh, as a as a sidelight, is there the chance that um oh that um school board policy that we were asking Dodi to present, uh, Mr. Matthew so sent an email with the draft. There's uh uh Fatilla. Um, Edison Wanika, can you uh, get that particular um, policy um, printed and then sign the legislative request? It's already pre-drafted. I just I think it just needs to uh, go through OLC's uh, processes. All right. Um, um, Otto, there was a text message from Honorable or Vice Chair Slater on perhaps getting a co-sponsor on the ICWA um, legislations. I think that's going forward. Um, let's see, I'm trying to find that. particular text message. So if you could help us in that way, um, it really help um, <clears throat> getting some of these items. I had already responded to Matthew so that there's a log jam at OLC for legislation requests, but however, since it's pre-drafted and it's already gone to uh, Department of Justice uh, review, then it it should be uh, one of the easy asks for OLC. All right. Hakushi, I But in the meantime, let me call this meeting of the um, Health, Education, Human Services uh, Committee regular meeting to order. Um, could you have legislative staff do the roll call? Good morning, Chair. So you went on mute.
Hello, good morning. Can you hear me? Okay. Now we can again. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Everyone on the call. Um, roll call. Vote for Health, Education, and Human Services Committee. Regular meeting, December 21st, 2022. And Honorable Paul Begay, Jr. Here. Honorable Paul Begay, Jr. answers roll call. Honorable Pranel Halona. Good morning, Halona's present. Honorable Pranel Halona answers roll call. Honorable Carl R. Slater. Honorable Charlene So. Honorable Daniel Iso. I'm here. Honorable Daniel Iso answered roll call. Honorable Edison J. Winika. Honorable Edison J. Winika answered roll call. Here you have four members present. Thank you. Uh, staff, Otto, um, the chair, Honorable Paul Begay, would you provide the invocation for us for today's meeting? Uh, chair, uh, Chair So, Vice Chair Sonella, leader, and members of the public, we'd like to offer the Rushing out the beat. It's hard to get in late. Yeah, the Ben Ben Hanaji soon part of the Koya Sasanit. We get the Naiba Banan Ilnish. Broya Asale Yia Nadil Ado Sad Sketa so Nantos Bakadi became a whole cast on the city. Liado, Ibikaho Iacodo, another illness or less. For a yahn Jahanani, Caldon, Jetna, it is so. Nighty Kiso, though in the Katnadi Lord. In Saki, so that that ain't a haggy. Asko. But only play he did aquagi. Then he cut deal was yet echo ya. Another illness he can be. She had the corner, John Gohadi, Lito, a yati, so does an ear, but not your ekodor, Nasa, the Nadi class or less. A call la ea, but she needs to start the inlini. I do the John Goe, Cheshmish will give a ea, a ea. It is not in Hina your class, I do a quarter in the Halish or so ea. The Shahan Nigo Ia Bahan in Tadi in Liniko Bahasan in a corner of Jesus Christ. No, at all. The Nidney. I don't even know. They don't sit in the Adon Hashan. None is placed over the sun, the sun of the honey closer. I don't sit in Hashan, the Nazar, the Ask Cut, the Nanistan Dati, and Jan Go Eco. A shadow horns have done the Hindi cast or Yabasahojon go ea or the ea the Kate. Mr. Honogo, just Mishnada at least. I don't know the hut. Mrs. Honogo, this has in a lunching ea. A king go ea cast all this. Go with all the water all this. I don't have this in that at all this. I shan't take up a garden that he did that from the Honogo this. The large about Badin's glad. But the instinct got even Jungo Ia. It's not for not for car to quite even Jungo, but on the night or car. Part of that's on to the Nabat specialties in which you have the a lot only a sneak or the day of car or the ego. Nothing to the whole juice. That was that something that I say that he that's on to the specialties in. A cosmic e holder, it is now hold to show he. Tabahalia Anna, so Nahalia, or is she better need cleaning? Naha, a long or instant or less, be naked to lead or less. A cosmic are the teachers with the needle. Ah, so yeah, teachers. A whole lot or less. You 
Good morning, Mark Siazi, uh, now by our EP Health Service, mostly here by uh, Mr. Leonard Chi and um, other staff, Ben Alford and Yvonne Kibillison. Thanks. Uh, good morning, um, has, um, members. This is Tommy Sissy from Austin, speaker on the line. Good morning, members of the HETS committee. This is Latanya Johnson from Navajo Department of Justice. Good morning, committee members. This is Boya Khanoachne Henderson with OLC on the call today. Thank you. Good morning, Etsy members, committee members. This is Trudy Sosi on the call with the Northern Tree House from Family Harmony Program Division of Social Services. Thank you.
anyone else when we first dialed in system announced that there were 20 people on the call. Good morning. <clears throat> this is Thomas E. Tawudi with uh, DPM. Okay, I guess uh, let's move along. Um, and and thank you for everybody calling in. Um, certainly, we miss the face-to-face uh, -face, um, committee meetings with having our presenters uh, be in, in the room with us as well and to have um, support staff, uh, attorneys with the Department of Justice and with our own <clears throat> legislative staff. Uh, we certainly, <clears throat> the committee has expressed it many times when we're in the room together to talk, uh, that energy, that interaction, <clears throat> Even the facial expressions, it really uh, brings and adds to the discussions. And from there, um, the committee has formed some ideas and some um, form some goals and objectives, and even discuss long range um, thoughts about how health, education, and the human services part of our oversight <clears throat> would be improved. And certainly there are still many weaknesses in our system of government. And I think in our four years, we did, we made some progress and uh, in improvements. And for that, for the all the folks that have come before the committee, we are grateful for that guidance. <clears throat> it was on behalf of the committee. Thank you for all the folks on the call. Um, with that, Ms. Uh, Angelita Benali, you uh, review the proposed agenda with us for adoption. Yes, Mr. Chair and members of the Health, Education, and Human Services Committee, you have your proposed agenda for the Health, Education, and Human Services Committee, 24th Navajo Nation Council, regular meeting, December 21st, 2022, 10 a.m., Presiding the Honorable Daniel Eso, Chairperson, the Honorable Carl R. Slater, Vice Chairperson. Places the Via Telecommunications, Window Rock, Navajo Nation, Arizona. One, call meeting to order, roll call, invocation announcements. Two, recognize guests and visiting officials. Three, review and adopt the agenda. Four, review and adopt the journals, none. Five, receiving reports. A is from the Indian Health Services, Navajo area. Regarding the Native American budget inclusion in appropriations in the appropriations budget. Uh, second is funding availability for decontamination of buildings. And third is the IHS Navajo area status and strategy on triple epidemic of flu, RSV and COVID variants. Presenters are uh, Captain Brian Johnson, Navajo area director, Indian Health Services. B, Division of Social Services, Department of Family Services, Family Harmony Northern Treehouse Shelter in Chiprock, Navajo Nation, New Mexico. Uh, first is the update and status of the shelter services. Second is the full-time availability of services. Presenters are Ms. Trudy Sosi, Principal Victim Witness Advocate with um, Shiprock Northern Treehouse Shelter. 
uh, Deanna Nesquit Gishi, Division Director for Navajo Division of Social Services, Regina Yazi, Program Manager 3, Department of Family Services, NDSS. C is a Division of Social Services in, in, regarding the completion of the following. Uh, Division of Social Services with an emphasis on the Department of Family Services written update to complete disbursements of employee general wage adjustments for FY 2021 and FY 2022. Second is a list of Division of Social Services employees with an emphasis on the Department of Family Services employees who have not received the FY21 and FY22 general wage adjustment completion dispersion to date and its explanations. Third is the confirmation of approximately uh, a reported uh, 39 DSS employees not receiving their paychecks in a timely and schedule uh, required schedule means for pay period ending December 2nd, 2022. In parentheses, payroll check schedule for uh, that were scheduled to be dispersed on December 14th, 2022. Presenters are Brenda Sosi, Principal Accountant, Division of Social Services, Racita Toddy, HR Classification and Pay uh, Manager with DPM, Garrick Sosi, Position Control Analyst, Support Division, DPM, Lita Sam, uh, Accounting Manager, Payroll Section, Office of the Controller, Deanna Niswit Gishi, Division Director with the Division of Nav uh, Navajo Division of Social Services. Regina Yazi, Program Manager 3, uh, Department of Family Services, NDSS. Uh, six old business none, seven new business none, eight close the meeting announcements and adjournment. Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Benali. Before we go to uh, the motion to adopt the agenda, the one, um, where you stated Native American budget. I, I, know, I know when I was uh, emailing you, I just put NA. So that was uh, meant to mean uh, Navajo area. Okay, thank you. I'll make that clear. Sure. Okay. <clears throat> With that correction, uh, committee members. Uh, do I have a motion? Do we have a motion? So Dr. Jim. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. They didn't even know they were using his that account number. Who didn't know? Marcus and committee members. Chairs open for a motion to adopt the corrected agenda. Motion that was appropriate. Okay, she launched a chair. Thank you for the motion. Committee second. members, do I hear a second? Second, Monica. Okay, she launched a Thank you. Um, committee members, are there any additions you wish to um, place on today's agenda? A chair, so a delegate Paul Oh. So, Chay, go ahead. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Chair. Good morning again to everybody. Everybody that's uh, on the line, uh, joining our meeting today. Um, just uh, a few calls that I've been getting within the last couple of days. Um, I'm wondering if it can be included. Uh, uh, with a little, mo uh, mo I don't know if modification is uh, needed or we can just include it under the social services report. Uh, DA, uh, the uh, funeral uh, funeral uh, arrangements. The question is, I believe one was uh, Valley Mortuary from Tuba City. Valley Mortuary from Tuba City. Uh, the issue there is when they get approval from social services, Tuba City Social Services, uh, for help in uh, a funeral service. And, and the nearest place and the most often place they use is Valley Mortuary in Tuba City. 
Valley Mortuary is not accepting any uh, any transactions that is done with so, so social services. Uh, they don't they don't accept or they don't want to work with social services mainly because uh, uh, the nation under so, social service or social service under the nation is not paying um, Valley Mortuary. They're, they're way behind a call. We're not going, we're not going to be working with any uh, funeral arrangements associated with social services done. So I, I think we need an update on that. As we all know, we, uh, when it, these issues, uh, funeral arrangements, uh, they don't take a, uh, you know, it, it requires us a very short time to do this. I'll call, uh, if they're getting the runaround and if they can't get anywhere with these arrangements, and people are stuck without any answers. Perhaps a social service can call to the city uh, valley mortuary and arrange or because right now at this moment there's a family calling me again. Uh, they are in the process of arranging a funeral. From social service, but mortuary will not accept it because the nation is not paying. Or So I'm wondering if that can be included under the social services report or Halit uh, Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Thank you, Chair. I think, yes, it is uh, very critical um, and um, necessary request because uh, I also receive text messages and emails regarding um, non-payment of funeral assistance um, as far back as March of 2021. It's just uh, uh, I, uh, I don't know the exact uh, circumstances that leads to that. So perhaps we could get a uh, a report not only from um, social services, and then at the same time when some of the funeral assistance was. Uh, all expended in a prior physical year. Then um, there was those donations that went to uh, emergency management, I think it was, and they were overseeing that particular fund for funeral assistance. And then perhaps we include a um, report from Office of the Controller, respective of that particular um, funding category and where other funds exist that would help in um, in those same circumstances. So, uh, moving party, so let's go ahead and and if that can't be accomplished, we could. I'll put it on the next Wednesday's agenda also. So, but in the meantime, if we put it on the agenda, Ms. Angelita Benali, please um, email uh, those entities for that particular report. So, uh, Hey, uh, you are the moving party. You want to include it, just uh, and then uh, we'll go to um, uh, 
firm. Honourable Winnicott to also consent to that. I chair, so uh, thank you again. And uh, yes, I would like to put that in the on the agenda. Thank you. I'll be the Okay, so we have a um, a motion to amend the agenda to include a report on the status of the funeral assistants uh, that are overseen by uh, Division of Social Services and the Office of Emergency Management and a report with from the Office of the Controller. So we've amended the agenda. So any other requests or amendments? If not, <clears throat> uh, ask, could you uh, provide the roll call vote on adopting the amended agenda? Chair, roll call vote for adopting an amend agenda. Honorable Paul Begay Jr., how do you vote? Yeah, we'll get Paul Begay vote screen. Honorable Paul Begay Jr. votes green. Honorable Pernell Halona, how do you vote? Well, that's okay. Honorable Pernell Halona votes green. Honorable Carr R. Slater, how do you vote? Honorable Charlene So, how do you vote? Honorable Edison J. Winika, how do you vote? Green. Chair, you have three members voting, zero opposed, and two not voting. Chair? Thank you. Uh, with that, committee members, we um, adopted the amended agenda. So uh, <clears throat> Ms. Angelita Benali, um, please help guide us forward um, on this uh, agenda. Uh, Mr. Chair and, and members of the Health Education and Human Services Committee, you're on number um, four, uh, review and adopt the journals none. And number five is receiving reports. A is with the Indian Health Services Navajo area, and it's a Navajo area budget inclusion uh, in the appropriations budget. Uh, second is the funding availability for decontamination of buildings. And third is the IHS Navajo area status and strategy on triple epidemic of flu, RSV, and COVID variants. The presenters are, um, is uh, Captain Brian Johnson, Navajo area director, Indian Health Services. Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Ms. Benali. So with that, um, Captain Brian Johnson, are you on the call? And if he isn't, then um, earlier we heard um, staff introduce themselves. Perhaps they've been delegated to provide the report. And if, and if you have, then go ahead and join, join us in presenting the report. Hey, good morning, uh, Chairman So This is uh, Mark Isiazi with the Navajo Indian Health Service Office of Tribal Partnership. How's it going today? Great. Thank you. Good to hear your voice. It's been a while. Yeah, it has. So, um, I, I can go ahead and... Uh, I did text Captain Johnson, so he, he may be able to um, dial in at some point. He, he was uh, had some conflicting schedules, but um, I can provide some updates related to item one and possibly item number two. But um, I, I wanted to discuss with the committee a little bit more um, with regard to the, the item topic. Um, if you could kind of elaborate 
on that a little bit more in terms of what the committee is actually looking for because um right now we're we're still in a short-term seven-day continuing resolution up until December 23rd of 2022 and the fiscal year 2023 appropriations also known as the omnibus bill um, has not passed yet um, so it's it's from my understanding that the senate um, does plan to vote uh, no later than thursday and the house will also take up the vote on friday so right now they're still in negotiations um, on, on some of these issues but what has been implied is that the ihs is looking at a $327 million increase in its proposed, in this proposed budget. So, um, so I'm kind of scanning through um, the bill itself and um, I'm not finding anything specific to the, the committee's um, question. And, and I'm hoping that the committee can elaborate a little bit more. Um, and uh, that that's an area that I'll have to look into and, and possibly provide a written response in terms of what the committee is looking for. Um, I'll, I'll turn it back over to you, Chair. To... Mm, yes, thank you. I guess the, the main um, thought is the, what is in the proposed on the business bill, the uh, overall IHS uh, funding package, and then also within that budget request, uh, what would be applicable to Navajo area in the way of um, um, funding, um, additional funding to run um, Navajo area uh, health care, uh, and then also perhaps. Uh, Funding for new construction, and then funding for uh, um, what is it? The SDS sanitary deficient uh, C systems, and then um, any new initiatives that uh, were proposed in that budget. So, Mr. Yazi, back to you. Yeah, certainly. Um, Captain Johnson just dialed in. So, um, I do have some updates, but I'm going to defer to him to see if he has any opening remarks. Captain Johnson, thanks. Yeah, I, hey, thank you, um, Marquise and uh, committee. It's uh, very good to be on with you today. Appreciate the opportunity. Um, there, it's good to hear your voice, and um, I would like to just ask, um, I, I realize we're talking presently about um, uh, the appropriations uh, budget for 2023. Um, would, it, would it be okay with the chair and committee if, if I mentioned a few things additionally as, as opening comments uh, and then move forward, uh, can, returning back to the topic of the uh, budget appropriation? Sure, uh, you have the latitude to even talk about the weather. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, that, makes me, that makes me feel much better. So, so yeah, uh, hey, it's uh, Captain Johnson here, and and uh, again, it's uh, good to be online with the committee today, um, and um, hope everyone's doing well. Uh, I I just wanted to. To, to share a few things that, that are going on and, and to make sure that we're providing the information that you need. And, um, and I'll also be available um, you know, offline if, if you would like to have any conversations um, uh, further on, on some of these topics. But I, I did want to uh, take a moment and um, just mention, uh, you know, as, as everyone, I believe, on, on this call and uh, on the committee is, is aware, uh, you know, Ms. So now the, serving as the IHS director, doing doing a, a fine job at that level, um, really getting into her um, uh, duties and responsibilities at headquarters, and we are uh, staying in contact with Ms. So on a on a regular basis as well. In fact, I had a conversation with her this morning, and um, just just wanted to share that that with you all. 
And, um, you know, she, she had requested that I serve as acting uh, area director during this uh, temporary time frame between uh, her departure to uh, Rockville and uh, bringing on a, you know, selecting or interviewing and selecting a new uh, area director. And so uh, I'll, I'll continue to serve in that capacity and, and unless they decide differently. But there's um, uh, been a lot going on. We've been staying tr tremendously busy with um, all of our federal sites. And we've also been in communications with uh, a number of our 638 partners as well around the Navajo area. Uh, I did want to just make sure in, 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 a, in a way of transparency for the, the committee. Um, we... We, we know that the area director position, it, it has been advertised and has, is also currently being re-advertised. And I just wanted to make sure that uh, if, you had, if there were any questions about what the status is of the area director position, that's where it's at right now. If you go on to the uh, ihs.gov website and uh, there, there's a search engine inside that website, the IHS website, where you can look at um, uh, job opportunities. And it's posted in there, and, and it's, it's post, posted to close. The announcement will close on January 13. Uh, so we've, uh, the re-advertisement uh, has, has pushed it out just a little bit, but um, you know, we're, we're confident we'll get some really great um, applicants for, for, that, for that position. Um, with, I just want to make sure that folks understand a little bit about the process on uh, whenever we're dealing with what's referred to as senior executive service positions. And the area director position is considered to be and what's referred to as an SES uh, position, which is senior executive service in the federal government. And basically, that's a uh, tier of executive service that's stands on its own, it's, it's above and beyond the general A uh, scales and, and, and job positions. Uh, normally, the federal service job positions, they, they pretty much go anywhere between a GS-4 all the way up to a GS-15. And then the, for the senior executive service, that's another tier level of executive status. So, um, I uh, just wanted to mention that, and anytime we have an SES position, such as the area director that's being advertised, I wanted to point out that that is handled and managed by IHS headquarters. And so Ms. So and her team at that level, uh, human resources at that level will be the entity um, that handles uh, receiving applications, uh, making the job announcements, doing the selection, the interviews and selections, those will all take place at the uh, headquarters level. Uh, they, the, the interviews will happen locally um, in, in the general region here. Um, sometimes they might be in Albuquerque or sometimes they might be here on the nation. But I just wanted to point that out that, um, that that's how that process works in case anybody had any questions on that. Uh, Timing-wise, the position closes again on the 13th of January, and it's very common for it to take a good week, uh, you know, seven to 10 days to review the candidates at the headquarters level where, where they would look through to see who all applied and then look at qualifications. And then uh, there's a process that they have uh, to identify qualified individuals uh, that, that, that they'll be going through. And then they'll move to, um, you know, set up um, the, the interviews for, for, the, for that position. So, so that's, we're looking at that, and um, I'm, I'm thinking in, in late, you know, uh, about uh, late January, you know, uh, maybe the third to fourth week in January, they should have a panel for that. And then uh, the next steps would be moving forward with setting up interviews with those candidates. Uh, so I'm thinking it would be within the month of February that that would be taking place, just based on how things are lining up right now. Um, also wanted to mention a, another item, uh, and I, I'm not sure if Ms. So had the opportunity to share with all the committee members 
uh, she may have before her departure. I'm, I'm, I'm sure she mentioned it at least, but just to touch on it again, uh, nationally, the, the Indian Health Service was approved <clears throat> for 12, or yeah, nationally, the Indian Health Service was approved for 12 new senior executive service positions, um, but that's at the national level. The Navajo area received three of those new SES level positions. And I wanted to comment on that real quickly because it's important for the committee members uh, in case uh, you didn't receive information or possibly moved on to other thoughts other than these positions. Um, I think it's good to reiterate. Um, so we, there are three new SES positions, which again, those go above and beyond the GS scale. And um, those apply to Chinle, uh, Shiprock, and Crown Point. And I will just, as an asterisk, mention that um, we, we already have an SES level position at GIMC. So this, the chief executive officer position there is a uh, SES position, and it has been for approximately, um, I think it's around 10 years now that that's been an SES level position. So now we're adding to that uh, Kinley, Shiprock, and Crown Point chief executive officers. Um, the way that this is rolling out is that the current CEOs at those locations, uh, if they're interested in applying, uh, they, would, they would need to compete uh, for their current position at an SES level. So um, this is not something where a person can just be appointed. It's um, it's a, a federal regulation that that it be competed, and um, so so that information has been shared, of course, over time with the incumbents in those positions, and then he or she had to make the decision: Are they interested in becoming SES level and, and applying for that and competing, or do they? Do, do they prefer to go another another route? And so our our internal plan for this was to um, is, was to improve succession planning while we're also getting these SES CEO positions in place. And what I mean by that is um, if if we w while we're creating these SES level CEO positions, we're also looking at creating deputy CEO level positions so that we can have some succession planning uh, to, to better support within leadership should we have a person move along, you know, decide to retire or otherwise, that we have at least two people at that high level to be able to uh, support each respective service unit. So um, the current incumb incumbents could, for example, be appointed as a deputy if they decided not to compete at the higher level for the SES position. And people have their own reasons, of course, why they may or may not be interested. And so we're just letting the competitive process uh, play out uh, during, during this time. And again, these CEO positions that are being advertised along with the area director position, uh, those are also managed by headquarters. So that's not something that the um, area will be handling. Um, it's, it's, we might help with lo logistics of interviews or something like that, but the uh, headquarters level will be uh, handling those, those inter interview selection and interview processes, those types of things. Um, so I, I, I wanted to touch on that topic uh, just so the committee members for your respective regions, uh, you know, I'm sure are interested in that. And um, we can certainly provide more information, but it's, of course, limited to a limited extent just because of um, Office of Personnel Management restrictions on how much information can be released. And um, but I, so that's that was one thing I wanted to, to touch on. I also wanted to touch on something that we've been working on uh, since Ms. So uh, arrived in headquarters. One of her big initiatives was to um, work on improving governance oversight at our various IHS federally managed facilities. 
And, um, and so one of the things she's done is worked with her team at that, at the headquarters level. And uh, similar to, I'm sure the, the HES committee, uh, you know, having its bylaws, when we, we talk about our governance on the health facility side, we too have our bylaws for governance. And um, she has worked and they have established and created a new set of uh, governing body bylaws that reflect uh, they're, they're going to be a national standard across IHS. So um, this is something that we've been in conversation with. I've attended a couple of meetings on and just recently, in fact, just the last two days, uh, we've updated our uh, governing body bylaws uh, to be consistent with the national standard uh, template that Ms. So has, has provided. So those are being required around the 12 different regions of IHS throughout the U.S. And um, I'm, I'm happy to report uh, that, that we were able to get ours updated and we are now in alignment with uh, that standard uh, process, which we believe will be a good thing overall. I wanted to give you some eyesight on that as well. Uh, another thing that, that I just, a couple of other things kind of loose loose ended things that I wanted to mention was that um, we've, we were recently informed that our Shiprock CEO, Ms. Vanessa Comer, who's uh, been at uh, Northern Navajo Medical Center and overseeing the Shiprock service unit for a number, a number of years. She's announced that she would be retiring uh, December the 31st of uh, this year. And um, so we are presently uh, meeting, talking about transition and, and what that's going to look like for a temporary status. And um, as I just mentioned, Ship, the Shiprock CEO position is one of those SES level positions. So it's presently advertised already. And uh, we'll be looking to make a selection for that as soon as, uh, as, soon as we can. But I wanted to bring that to the committee's attention about Ms. Comer. Some of you may know her, may know her well. She's been a very outstanding uh, CEO for us and just felt it was time for her to retire. Um, another item that I wanted to mention, and I think the committee was made fully aware, is the uh, just, I know there's so many different things going on, but we did. Uh, in, in the recent month and a half or so, did make a permanent selection at uh, Gallup Indian Medical Center for for, uh, uh, for Chief Executive Officer, and that would be uh, Commander Pamela Detsoy Smiley, who is an uh, individual who was uh, born and raised on Navajo, and um, she's presently in place as the Chief Executive Officer and um, has has been doing a great job, and um, just just wanted to reiterate that. Uh, if, you, if you have any questions on that. And then um, for now, I, I also wanted to mention that when we look around the uh, area at our various res respective uh, federal service units, we have our, uh, presently we have our Chin Lee uh, service unit where we have a, our permanent CEO, Ms. Darlene Chi. She still remains in place at uh, Chin Lee as a permanent CEO. And then at Kayenta, we have uh, Ms. Mariva Plummer, who continues to be the permanent CEO. Um, both of those um, born and raised on Navajo as well. And we're very proud of that. And then um, I wanted to mention that Crown Point is presently where we have an acting CEO. And um, again, Crown Point is similar to Shiprock. It's gonna be one of those SES level positions. So it too is presently advertised and uh, hopefully we'll be making a, a permanent selection on that one as well. Um, in terms of, I, I didn't want to go over too much clinical or public health. We, we did ask uh, Dr. Christopher Gentoff with the Chinley Service Unit, as well as Dr. Terry Baugh with the Office of Public Health at Chinley to, to join this call. And so, uh, Chair, they're, they're on, they should be on the line, and we can check on that in a moment. But I I, I did want to mention that um, at a high level on, on COVID-19, you know, we are seeing uh, decreasing cases. Uh, we, um, we had a phone call uh, just yesterday with our Neville Area IHS leadership team. And um, 
and during that, it was very apparent that many of our facilities are seeing reduced um, uh, number of, or reduced incidents of, of COVID-19, and um, which is a good sign. We're very happy about that. But we also talked about RSV and influenza, as, as was kind of touched on in, in your agenda today. And uh, we, we are seeing some of those cases sustain and in some cases uh, are elevated. And I'll, I'll let uh, the, the doctors uh, speak to that as to what they're experiencing on those fronts, on that, on that forefront. But I did want to mention that uh, with COVID-19, our, our sites continue to immunize, immunize, test, and treat. COVID-19, and we'll continue to do so. We're, we're doing fine with any, um, any treatments that we need or any supplies that we need. We do check in and um, make sure our facilities are not you know, running low or have concerns about uh, not having adequate supplies. So we're doing well in that fashion. But I'll, I'll let them talk a little bit about um, the um, the, the uh, uh, COVID-19, RSV, and, and influenza. <clears throat> um, with that being said, I'm, I'm thinking, um, I, I did hear the conversation about the IHS uh, budget. And while we, we don't have a, a whole lot of information, what, what, you know, one of the big, and I'm not sure if Mr. Yazi was able to touch on it, we're, we're hoping to hear something really, really soon uh, today uh, or by Friday at, at the latest um, on hopefully a passage. But um, we know that one of the one of the most important areas of that budget is what you know what's referred to as the advanced advance appropriation. Um, that will be huge for us in terms of a uh, healthcare, not only for us, but it will also be a positive thing for the um, for the 638 side as well. Um, in the past, when we've gone to these continuing resolutions uh, in terms of our uh, appropriation, it, it in, in, in some cases when the um, we went through government shutdowns, it causes not only not not only does it cause issues within our uh, within our healthcare system uh, where we're having to identify third-party collections to try to run on that solely without an appropriation whenever we have a, a government shutdown, which you can imagine the challenges with that. Now you're switching from several different lines of, of budget and appropriation to now you're just, uh, we're just going over to what do we do in terms of collections and do we have adequate number to keep everyone working or do we have to you know, send some workers home? It creates a fury, a mad fury of situations. And so um, we're, we're very, excited and hopeful right now that this advanced appropriation will be approved. We do know that the NAB, it's my understanding the Navajo Nation has been supportive of this and, and for that we are, we are grateful uh, to uh, your committee as, as well as the nation overall and um, hopefully we'll hear some positive news on that. But I, I did hear your, um, the, the interest level you have in the very, for the um, appropriation and I, I know things have been changing we, uh, I know Mr. Um, Yazi did mention uh, the, um, that we're looking at a $327 million increase as, in, in the proposed budget. And then I understand you, you are interested in the uh, healthcare construction and some of the um, other line items that, that we'll hopefully be seeing. And what I would say is that we'll do our best to get that information to the committee if that, if that will work for the committee. Um, we'll reach out to our uh, headquarters finance lead, and you all are aware, you're familiar with Ms. Uh, Jillian Curtis. We'll, we'll touch base with her and see what we have that we can stand on solidly at this point in time. But hopefully by, by Friday, there is a vote and, and there is an adoption of, of the proposed budget as it, as it presently stands, but that'd be great. Um, with that being said, Chair, if it's okay with you, I would like to check to see if um, if Dr. Gentoff and or Dr. Terry Ball has been able to join the line. Hi, Captain Johnson. Yes, I believe we're both on. Okay, yes. nice, nice to hear your voice. Thank you very much. And I, I just wanna do a brief introduction. Um, Dr. Christopher Gentoff recently joined our Chin Lee team as the cl clinical director in Chin Lee. 
Um, I found him to be an outstanding individual and clinician. We really enjoyed having him aboard. Uh, so thank you, Dr. Gentoff, for, for joining. And then, uh, of course, I think everyone here on the line is familiar with Dr. Terry Vaughn who has done an outstanding job throughout uh, COVID-19 and beyond, uh, does an outstanding job with the uh, public health program out at Chinle as well. But um, we did see the item, item on, the, um, on the, today's agenda concerning the Navajo area status and strategy on triple epidemic of flu, RSV, and COVID. And um, I wanted to give them an opportunity, and if, if, if Chair, if that's, a pro, if that's okay, just to provide some information on those topics. With, is, is, that a, is that appropriate, sir? Yes, it is. Okay, okay. thank you for that. Thank uh, you. So I'll, I'll turn to Dr. Gentoff. Uh, yes, yeah, Dana, good morning, thank you. I'm gonna actually ask Dr. Va to speak first because what I have to say will make more sense with the context she can provide. If that's okay with you, Dr. Va. Yes, of course. Thank you so much, Dr. Gentoff. Thank you, Captain Johnson. Um, and thank you all for allowing us to be a part of this call today. Um, so the first thing I'm going to speak on is just, you know, what the national, regional, and then Navajo area, but really Navajo Nation trends are currently. Um, and as Captain Johnson mentioned, we are in this triple-demic of covid um, RSV, which stands for respiratory syncytial virus and influenza, the flu. Um, for COVID-19, our current status is that cases still remain high, but have steadily started to go down. We are seeing this at our with our area office data. We're also seeing this with our Navajo Epicenter partners data. Um, and so we know it's still high activity in terms of high transmission risk, but it has been continuously coming down, which is reassuring, as Captain Johnson noted. Um, one of the things we are monitoring closely is hospitalizations, and we know that hospitalizations are a delayed marker for this, and we're seeing that slightly go up, but not nearly as high as what we're seeing regionally or nationally. Um, with that being said, RSV, respiratory syncytial virus, you know, with both flu and RSV, it started way earlier this year compared to prior years. That was the national trend, that is the regional trend, and we saw that here, we are seeing that here in um, a Navajo Nation as well. And so typically, you know, RSV presents around like, you know, January or February, but this year it just came earlier. Um, and so RSV activity, it's peaking and we believe if we follow the regional trends of the four states, we will be coming down. Um, and influenza is going up, um, but it's starting to slow down. And so even though it's still increasing week to week, it's not, it's not doing that skyrocketing um, um, rise in cases. All of those three things is indeed, you know, we're seeing like this increase just in general respiratory activity. That's what we're seeing. So in summary, COVID is coming down. Down, but still high. RSV is likely peaking and starting to come down. And then flu, it is still going up, um, but it's starting to slow down. We do think all of this will continue to persist probably into January and February of the winter season. This is a thought that, you know, the, on the national picture, they, they are preparing for that. Regional, we're, regionally, we're preparing for that. Here locally, we're also preparing for that, that we have probably another month or two of this, um, this high respiratory activity. In regards to strategy, one of the biggest strategies that we continue to rely heavily on is coordinating communication. And so Navajo Area Office, the team, um, the EPI team there still continues to communicate um, all of these activities with our Navajo epicenter and vice versa. And that way we can understand um, the situation but much better and prepare much better and coordinate activities as well. Um, in addition to that, the major thing is vaccinations. And so we continue to push for that in the public despite the vaccine fatigue, which I know exists. What does that mean? Right now, we know that the COVID activity um, is likely, you know, very similar to what we're seeing nationally and regionally is that BQ.1 and BQ.1.1 strain. We haven't detected XBB on Navajo Nation just yet. Um, the bivalent booster is very effective against the current um, circulating strains right now. And so that's what we're pushing for is that right now, as yeah, which is great, as of now, six months and older are um, are now eligible 
um, for the bivalent booster. There's some nuance to that, but for the most part, that's the message we're sending. Six months and older, you can get that bivalent booster. It is effective against the circulating strain right now. In addition to that is flu vaccines. Flu vaccines um, were nationally, unfortunately, we believe this is due to vaccine fatigue. The the percent of flu vaccine uptake has been low this season compared to prior years. It's all we're seeing the same thing here on Navajo as well. Um, and so we continue to encourage the public, please get your bivalent booster and also please get the flu vaccine. RSV, there is no vaccine for RSV. Um, and I'll speak a little bit to more about the strategy on that. Um, you know, um, the other thing I do want to say in terms of vaccine, I know we're pushing for this, but we do have some things to highlight is that the Navajo Nation. Uh, and I commend our people for this, the people that we serve for this, has one of the highest vaccine rates still for both COVID and for flu. Even though we're not where we want to be, we're still higher than um, you know national numbers as well as even regional numbers. And what I mean by that is, for example, about 40% According to our Navajo area, you know, Navajo um, IHS numbers, 40% of our user population have been vaccinated against the flu, much higher than national numbers and much higher than other areas. For COVID, close to 71% have completed a primary series, which is incredible. That means 71% of the user population, all ages, zero and up, have completed a primary series, and 20% are up to date with the bivalent booster. And so that's something to commend, but we continue to still push for it because that's our one of our preventative tools in regards to um, public health. Um, other things that we are pushing for as well, because you know um, we're asking folks to continue with um, their mitigation strategies. And I think one of the reasons why we're not seeing that same level of hospitalizations or even mortality here in Navajo Yes, because of our high immunization rates, but also because folks take mitigation really seriously. And what I mean by that is that people still mask up and that people uh, understand that, you know, washing your hands are important, is important. Um, sanitizing surfaces is important. And staying home when sick is very, very important, um, especially when we think about everything, not just COVID, um, including RSV and flu. Not all as I was saying, you know, RSV, we don't have a vaccine for that. And so that's why these other measures are really important. We aren't asking people to, um, to not gather. I know that's very much needed these days, especially to connect with family, community, and friends. It's more just to understand what they can do to be safe and who to protect. Um, the high, which brings me to the third strategy, is protecting our highest risk groups. Right now, the highest risk groups are kiddos babies less than two years of age um, because they're really at high risk um, for you know hospitalizations um, in regards to RSV um, especially in regards to RSV and flu of course um, and then our other highest risk group is our elderly folks right those that are 65 and older and so the message we're sending to the public is yes you can gather these are things you can do make sure you vaccinate both for both flu and COVID before gathering, that will protect everyone, especially those little kiddos who may not be eligible for um, all the vaccines or treatments just yet. Um, and so we are encouraging that message. You may gather, but this is how you do it safely. But if you're sick, please don't gather, please don't stay home and protect those that are less than two, our little babies, as well as our elderly um, folks. The third thing um, that we our um, messaging is, of course, early testing and treatment. For both RSV and, I'm sorry, for both COVID and flu, you know, the public health teams try to message that in terms of like treatment, there is there is treatment available, but it's all time dependent. And so if you're symptomatic, go ahead and get tested. Um, and then we will aim to try to connect folks that are eligible and symptomatic um, to treatment if like I said, if eligible, there is a time um, a time component component to that um, for both treatment for flu and RSV. I'm going to stop there, and I know Dr. Gentoff can provide a little bit more insight on how our clinical and ED teams are coordinating across um, coordinating efforts and communication across Navajo Nation as well, and with our state partners. Thank you, Dr. Gentoff. All right, thank you, Dr. Ba. That was, uh, as always, informative. Uh, and broad. Um, thank you. Uh, so I'm going to describe the, the, the context uh, in which we're providing care 
uh, here on Navajo Nation. So uh, taking the, the largest picture of, of regional and, and national health care, uh, as has been reported largely in mainstream media and the news, there are significant shortages uh, across all aspects of healthcare. So uh, following the pandemic, uh, we've lost a lot of people who have simply left healthcare as their profession, uh, most notably among our nursing colleagues, uh, who are the real heart and soul of many healthcare institutions. Uh, there have been uh, enormous efforts spent in uh, fighting against the COVID-19 pandemic, which has resulted in uh, some resources uh, that would have normally gone towards primary care or preventive medicine uh, being uh, sequestered from uh, primary care. Uh, and as also, as we were encouraging folks to avoid contact and, and following social uh, distancing and, and public health measure, measures, uh, there was a period of time where people were not uh, coming to clinics for preventive or primary care, resulting in uh, really delayed uh, uh, care and therefore an increased risk of complications for chronic illnesses like uh, uh, heart disease, hypertension, and diabetes. So all of those things are just in the water now for all of us who are either receiving or providing care. More specifically regionally, since about January of 22, around the time that Omicron, uh, the first Omicron surge hit, uh, there were really marked limitations for uh, inpatient capacity at hospitals throughout our region. Uh, the Four Corners region, particularly hard hit, were both New Mexico and Arizona, uh, resulting in really significant limitations in uh, us at IHS sites being able to obtain inpatient care, what we typically call beds, at tertiary care centers or receiving facilities, places that have all of the additional resources like specialist physicians and, and surgical specialists and surgical equipment. Um, so that results in uh, prolonged periods of time where we're uh, trying to get patients into, uh, uh, say, a, a Banner Hospital in Phoenix or University of New Mexico in Albuquerque, uh, where they're just full. So we need to begin to uh, seek uh, transfers to facilities further and further away, Flagstaff, Tucson, even looking as far as Las Vegas facilities in, in Colorado, Utah, and Southern California. And all of this in the setting of having relatively limited uh, EMS units, not just to provide EMS 911 response, but also to provide transportation from one facility to another. So say I have a patient here at Chin Lee who needs to go to uh, Phoenix for specialty care. Um, I have, we have a limited number of airplanes or helicopters that are, have the appropriate staff and the appropriate equipment to transport that patient. So all of these things create a sort of just a, uh, baseline of stress for the provision of care uh, during this triple demic of influenza, RSV, and COVID. Now, there have been some useful responses from the states in the area. Uh, on the 1st of December uh, this month, this year, uh, the New Mexico Department of Health declared a public health emergency in light of the pediatric respiratory RSV surge that Dr. Va had described. So basically what uh, the, the, the primary concern is that little children, particularly under the age of one, if they get this virus, there is a chance that it will settle into their lungs and cause the small, small airways of these little tiny humans to get uh, constricted and they have trouble moving oxygen in and carbon dioxide out. Uh, when they have difficulty breathing, sometimes they just need some uh, uh, good old fashioned suction, which is just uh, pulling boogers out of their nose. Uh, sometimes they need oxygen provided to uh, supplement the oxygen in the uh, air. Sometimes they need even more powerful uh, oxygen, whether it's a uh, hopefully a non-invasive where we can put a, a, a fancy nasal cannula on to push air in under high pressure to keep those airways open. Sometimes those kiddos uh, need uh, to be put on a breathing machine so they're sedated and, and uh, given medication so they don't fight the breathing tube and we can breathe for them for a while. 
Um, so the New Mexico Department of Health uh, issued that public health emergency uh, less than like two weeks later, the Arizona Department of Health released an all hospital letter uh, recommending uh, uh, sort of a, a almost a triage approach to taking care of sick kids first. Uh, this was in light of uh, hospitals throughout the region, not just uh, Albuquerque, but also Phoenix, Flagstaff, and Tucson, facing really significant burdens of lots and lots of kids, uh, really, really sick children in the emergency department awaiting pediatric intensive care beds uh, to, on the order of like 10 kids a day awaiting uh, an ICU bed who are uh, being what's called boarded or temporarily housed either in an emergency department or even sometimes in a hallway of the larger hospitals. Uh, and then on uh, February 13th, uh, the Arizona Department of Health opened up a, uh, co a, a transfer service that allows uh, uh, 638 tribal and critical access hospitals to uh, call that transfer center and enable us to um, obtain transfers for our patients uh, with less work done by us. So it offloads all of the, the, the clerical work of calling all of the other hospitals uh, it's in order to obtain beds for our hospitals here at the remote sites. Um, so that's those are some of the state interventions that have been done to, that have been engaged to help us. Uh, among the IHS and 638 sites, uh, we have become unfortunately quite familiar with dealing with uh, the crisis over the uh, crises over the past couple of years. We have established uh, coordinating phone calls where, uh, as often as weekly, uh, heads of emergency departments and uh, heads of pediat uh, pediatric departments from the various sites in the region will call to share resources, to uh, develop common solutions to common problems, uh, and to discuss the ways we can support each other. Sometimes this uh, results in um, facility to facility transfers when resources are available. So for instance, if uh, Tuba City or Fort Defiance is uh, at capacity for pediatric care, uh, Chinle could provide inpatient care. So we can keep patients closer to home, but provide care here. Um, so that we call that load leveling or lateral transfers. Uh, in addition with these phone calls, we've also had the presence of the Arizona Department of Health and the New Mexico Department of Health, as well as representatives from the University of New Mexico, Phoenix Children's Hospital and the, and the Banner System. Uh, and all of these have allowed us to share resources and to uh, develop some really creative problem solving uh, approaches. Um, and then uh, finally, at each individual institution, we are augmenting our capacity to provide care for these uh, the RSV surge kiddos so that the younger kiddos who are more sick, who need something like oxygen or stronger. So we're adjusting by procuring the appropriate equipment and training staff appropriately, and sometimes uh, at physically moving things around inside of our hospitals to have more physical space to care for beds. Uh, and it's really been a remarkable effort uh, across all levels of uh, the hospitals, uh, uh, respiratory therapy, nursing, pharmacy, physicians, environmental services, the gamut. Um, and then finally, just to reinforce uh, a few of the points that Dr. Va made, uh, the, the first step in all of this is prevention. Uh, so uh, the vaccinations, we do know that the COVID vaccinations have a really profound impact on reducing the severity of the illness. Uh, vaccines, we, we had hoped they would have a really profound impact on reducing infection itself, but really that's not what a vaccine is, is designed to do or can do in the body. I like to think of it like a seatbelt. A seatbelt isn't gonna stop you from having an automobile accident, but it's sure gonna help if you get in an accident. Uh, vaccines do the same thing for our body. So we do know that the COVID vaccines reduce the risk of severe disease, meaning needing oxygen or hospitalization by anywhere from half to up to 90% reduced rate. Uh, the flu vaccine, fortunately this year, the, the, vac the, the early predictions on the type of flu we have seem to be very good. So the vaccine is about 50% uh, help, 50% uh, is, uh, sorry, is about 50% effective. So the same as the COVID vaccine. 
Uh, for RSV, there is no real known treatment for it, and there's no true vaccine for it. There is a medication called uh, uh, Synergis or Pelivizumab. It is a monoclonal antibody similar to the monoclonal antibodies that we used for uh, COVID. However, uh, it requires um, five different shots over the course of a month. Uh, and is very difficult to obtain and very difficult to administer. Uh, so it's been, and it's been restricted by the uh, uh, Official Society of the American Association of Pediatricians. Um, during this year, once the RSV surge was noted, the National uh, Pharmacy and Therapeutics uh, uh, Committee of IHS expanded our capacity to give it here uh, to our, our indigenous patients locally. So we have expanded the, the number of patients we give it to. So normally it's just to premature kids with harder lung disease. We've expanded that and given it to many, many more kids this year in the hopes of reducing severe illness. And again, as Dr. Voss said, the, the key is prevention. So that's uh, uh, good hand hygiene. We know for sure that RSV and flu can spread on those droplets we get on our hands. So we encourage washing hands or in, uh, for kids, just maybe dipping them in hot soapy water because they're so boogery and get it all over. Um, avoiding sick contacts. So if you're sick, stay away from other people. If your kid's sick, stay, keep them home. And if you know someone else is sick, encourage them to avoid contacts as well. Uh, and uh, we we do know that masking is helpful for COVID. We don't know for sure that masking is helpful for RSV or flu, but we are hopeful that they the masking policies have uh, will have proved helpful uh, once we have a better sense. Uh, and finally, just in terms of the COVID treatments, the the test to treat and the the medications that. The, uh, Dr. Ba mentioned, um, with the new variants in COVID, uh, the monoclonal antibodies we used to use most recently, bebtilovimab and evushel, but previously citrovimab uh, and Regeneron, unfortunately, the current strains evade the efficacy of those medications, so we can't use those anymore. That said, we still have the pills Paxlovid, which is the best medicine we have now. Uh, and we have the uh, IV medication Remdesivir. Both of those are very effective at reducing um, uh, severe disease. So for patients who are at high risk for severe disease, meaning those with uh, uh, obesity, diabetes, heart trouble, or advanced age, elders 65 or higher, we really encourage those folks to get tested and hopefully link to treatment early. Um, those treatments, the sooner you get them, uh, the more effective they are. Uh, and I will stop here. Thank you very much for your time. It's an honor to be here. This is Captain Johnson. With with that said, Chair uh, Chairman So, uh, I'll, I'll that that'll be the IHS report, and and I'll turn back to you, sir. Thank you, Captain Johnson, and to um, the doctors that <clears throat> presented this um, report. We appreciate it. It's very informative, and I guess <clears throat> in a way to get this out to the public. Uh, could you furnish to the committee um, some main bullet point items that could be posted in a press release uh, by uh, the committee through the Navajo Nation um, <clears throat> communication system? Uh, I would ask uh, Mr. Tommy Sosin to get our uh, press release people to <clears throat> help craft a press release that would uh, encompass and entail um, these major items that uh, our IHS staff uh, relate to us because it is uh, very important that public know. And again, um, just that aspect that it, it affects our <clears throat> most vulnerable uh, parts of our Navajo society there, the young and the elderly. So in that respect, that's, I feel like it's very important we do that. 
and uh, committee members, the chair is open for a motion to accept the report. Motion, Delegate Begay. Thank you, Sir Chief. Do I hear a second? Second, Monica. Thank you. Priscilla, okay. In, in, in view of the time that the time constraints that we have, uh, we will um, dispense with any further questions. So uh, let's go to a roll call vote. Thank you, uh, Captain Johnson and all the IH staff that were, IHS staff that were on the call. We appreciate that. The committee has had a good uh, relationship with Navajo area, and we do appreciate the the changes. There's the focus on um, healthcare delivery, and certainly it's probably always been there. But you know the connotation was um, IHS doesn't care, but with our relationship that we've established, we really feel that um, <clears throat> the, the whole system is to be commended all the way from um, the clinics and, and the centers and then to uh, the hospitals. We really appreciate it. And of course, we um, we can't say anything better than to have a person from Navajo area to be the national director of the Indian Health Service. And we look to new appointments in, in those vacancies that are occurring. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Chair, for those comments. And that, that's really uh, very meaning for us, meaningful for us to, to hear that from the um, Health Education and Human Service Committee, we we do uh, re that re really does mean a lot. So we appreciate you taking time to make those comments, and um, I I do wish wish the uh, committee members uh, the best going forward, and and we're looking to continue that relationship. So uh, thank you again, and thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning with you. Thank you. Uh, so. Um Staff, could we have the roll call vote to accept the report? Thank you. Chair, roll call vote to accept the report from Indian Health Services. Honorable Paul Begay, Jr., how do you vote? Delegate Paul Begay votes green. Honorable Paul Begay, Jr., votes green. Honorable Panahalona, how do you vote? Honorable Carl Slater, how do you vote? Honorable Carl Slater votes green. Honorable Charlene So, how do you vote? I vote green. Honorable Charlene So votes green. Honorable Edison J. Winika, how do you vote? Green. Honorable Edison J. Winika votes green. Once again, Honorable Pranel Halona, how do you vote? I vote green. Honorable Pranel Halona votes green. Chair, you have five members in favor, zero opposed. <coughs> Chair, not voting. Chair? Thank you. I uh, appreciate that. Committee members, uh, a vote of five in favor, zero opposed. Chair, not voting. Uh, let's go on. <clears throat> Earlier, uh, Ms. Finale uh, sent out um, legislation that were um, had completed the five-day comment period. Uh, Ms. Angelita Benali, of those legislations that you sent to the committee, is there any of them that need to go on to another committee? Or uh, those let I didn't really review it. Um, is the committee the final authority on those three resolutions? No, Mr. Chair. 
and members of the Health Education and Human Services Committee. Uh, last week, the um, the committee did address all of the uh, legislations that were available and referred to the Health Education and Human Services Committee for action. And all of the ones that um, are ready for uh, consideration by HESS were, were done last week. And, uh, and all of the committee reports have been signed. And there was one, um, one legislation that where um, HESS was the final authority that was regarding the plan of operation for the Navajo Nation Board of Education. And I believe that that one is in the in its review process within our office. Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Vermali. Uh, uh, and Ms. Lawyer Henderson's on the call. Ms. Barbaroff and Ms. Henderson and I have been uh, in email conversation that uh, legislation to um, establish the background checks for uh, school board members. Um, Honorable Edison Winika did sign the request and they're working hard to um, finish it in the next few hours. So, Honorable Wanika, if you would stick around to uh, sign on the, as either the sponsor or co-sponsor of that uh, policy, then it could hit the five-day comment period at 5 p.m. today, would be ready for next week. The other consideration that I have going is it seems like <clears throat> we're going to have a Navajo Nation Council special session on the 27th of May, and it may go into the 28th. And our regular test committee meeting would, would be the 28th. And by Navajo Nation law, when the council is in session, no other committee can meet. So the consideration would be for the committee to go into a special meeting in lieu of the regular meeting on either the 29th or the 30th. Committee members, those are some thoughts to ponder as we move on to the next uh, report. Um, Ms. Benali, take us to item 5B. Yes, Mr. Chair and members of the Health Education and Human Services Committee, the next um, report is B, 5B, uh, Division of Social Services, Department of Family Services, uh, Family Harmony, Northern Treehouse Shelter, Shiprock, Navajo Nation, New Mexico, an update and status of the shelter services, full-time availability of services. Presenters are Ms. Trudy Sosi um, with the Shiprock, Northern Treehouse Shelter, uh, Department of Family Services, NDSS, also Deanna Neswit Gishi, Division Director for NDSS, and Regina Yazi, Program Manager 3, Department of Family Services, NDSS. Mr. Chair. Thank you. Ms. Sosi. Good morning. Here I am on the call. Uh, you may proceed. And good morning, Yate Bene, um, Hesi committee members. My name is Trudy Sosi. Poadlini and Tia Ose Tachini Bashi Kini Kilisti in Armai Che, don't manage Bizi Armai Nali. I am from the Shifra area and I am the principal victim witness advocate for the Family Harmony Program and I manage the Northern Treehouse Shelter in Shifra, New Mexico. And as um, as far as the updates and the shelter services, well, as of today, Northern Treehouse Shelter is not operated due to lack of staffing. 
But however, we we continue to provide um, the other program services such as shelter placement, meaning that when our clients call, we assist them with placing them in the shelters in the surrounding area. So we work with like the Farmington Shelter, Chianta Shelter, Gallup, Landing, uh, we can go as far as the Wrangell Flagstaff. So that's what, um, what we're doing right now is placing our clients in a safe shelter. We have um, safety planning with our clients. We go over a safety plan. Um, it can be over the phone in person. So we conduct that with all our clients to make sure they know the local police numbers, local emergency numbers, hospital. Um, if they need counseling, we also provide that also um, when we interact with them. We do transportation if needed. Transportation meaning um, we can transport them to a safe shelter. We can transport them, transport them to their appointment, um, their counseling session, and or even submitting housing application. And we do a lot of court support. Court support meaning that we assist our clients with filing protection orders. We work directly with our courts here um, in Shiprock, Annis, Windrock, on the Navajo Nation. And there are some clients that do file protection orders in the Farmington District Court. So we'll assist with that as well. We'll review the court um, process as far as what they need to expect when they're in a protection order hearing. And then afterwards, if the protection order is being granted, you know, what are their rights? What are their rights as a victim and what can they do? And then we also do um, police escorts where we can um, arrange a police escort with our local law enforcement to, um, we can retrieve children our, and we can um, get the clients with belongings from the um, offender's home. We do referrals um, to other agencies on behalf of our clients for housing, financial assistance, even counseling. Even if it's um, like a thrift store for clothing, we do referrals in that area as well. Um, networking and networking with other agencies um, is another thing we do, like Hannah, Food Stamp Office, the hospital, um, the nonprofit, the Mount Shiprock. Farmington area, so that's what we're doing. And then um, we also do um, prevention and awareness on domestic violence. So those are the services that are ongoing. And these services are offered, um, but right now we're operating Monday through Friday, eight to five, and I am on call after five. So I do take on call, um, on call crisis calls, and my number is um, given to um, other agencies if needed. They can call me and reach me on my work cell phone, and I'm available for any services like shelter placement. If it's an emergency, uh, if it's a protection order to be filed after five, I will refer that to law enforcement because they have the authority to file that after five. So those are the services that are being offered at this time, honorable um, chair. So. Thank you, um, Ms. Sophie. Committee members, if we could have a motion and a second before we proceed to questions. Motion hello. Motion hello now, thank you. Do I hear a second? Second. Thank you, uh, Vice Chair uh, Slater. Um, anyone else uh, have a question? Committee members have any questions for Ms. Bosey? Uh, and if not, then we can proceed to second part where um, <clears throat> Ms. Uh, Deanna Neswick Gishi has the floor to provide additional items on this report. Ms. Deanna Neswick Gishi. You have the cell conference floor. Yeah. 
Good morning. This is Marlinda uh, with Division of Social Services. Um, Executive Neswick Gishi is on travel and she has other commitments um, this morning. Um, but I I can um, um, continue with the report along with our staff. Uh Marlinda in Shia Ado my Dishkizinchle. Is it Lana Bashish Chain, Sedish Gizni Dashu Che, Ado Nakaden at the Shandale? Um, the first bullet item um, is to provide an update on the general wage adjustments for FY 2021 and 2022. And this morning, um, our staff, Roslyn Begay, sent um, a matrix to the oversight committee as as part of our report. So I will briefly go over that, and if there's any information um, that I may have overlooked, I'll have Brenda Sosi um, chime in as well for this first bullet point. Uh, <clears throat> if you would send the uh, report to Ms. Angelita Benali, then she can distribute it to the uh, committee members. As of right now, we haven't received it in our email system. Um, yes, sure. Um, we Mr. can Chair? go ahead, Ross. Mr. Chair, members of the Health, Education and Human Services Committee and Ms. Angelita Benali. I did send a report this morning at 9.38 to all the members of the committee and Angelita Benali. I can resend it again. Thank you. So I, well, yes. Go ahead and continue. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. So there's, it's a two page um, matrix and I'll go ahead and start with the, um, what we call the BQ salary scale, which covers um, October 1st, 2021 to September 30th, 2022. And um, so as far as the general wage adjustment and we'll just be speaking specific to the Department of Family Services. Um, there's three process um, in completing the, the GWA. There's the budget process, um, the personnel action form, and then the back pay and, and payroll. And so as far as the budgeting process, um, and in the past, our um, principal accountant has provided a report on, on the budget process. And um, she did mention um, to the oversight committee that there had to be extensive calculation that needed to be completed for each employee. So that has been completed for the BQ salary scale. And then a budget revision also needed to be completed. Um, and, and this, um, effort was um, had to be completed um, with a lot of coordination and communication with um, the Office of the Controller. And they also verified the availability of funds, so that is completed. The next step is the personnel action forms. And the staff member from Department of Family Services um, her name is Charlene Largo. She did complete all the PAFs and they were submitted again to the Office of the Controller where they verify the funds and that's been completed. 
Um, the PAFs are now um, with DPM um, and they are going to be updating the PAFs in the HRIS system. And um, I believe um, staff members from the Department of Personnel Management um, are on call and they can, they can provide an update on where they're at. But once DPM does complete the update in their system, then we'll get go to the next step, which is the back pay and payroll. And so um, internally, the back pay forms um, have been completed. And to be one step ahead, um, they have all also been submitted to payroll. Um, we wanted to mention that um, we, the staff here pre prepared eight back pay forms for each employee with totaling 848 back pay forms that needed to be prepared. So when um, DPM does their part, then um, payroll um, will also begin to um, update these back pays in their system as well. So we, the next step again is um, these back pay forms again have to be verified for funds availability by OOC and then um, sent to payroll where they verify against the timesheets. And then the final review would be by accounts payable. So the GWA for the BQ salary scale um, is in, pro in progress. And although um, it may seem that um, we should have started with the BJ salary scale, but in actuality, there was more um, work that needed to be completed with the BQ salary scale. And with consultation with OOC, um, it was better to start with the, the BQ salary scale. So now going to the BJ salary scale, which is the former um, fiscal year. Um, here, the um, the funds are available for the GWA and the funds. Um, the next step here would be we need to work with OOC to make sure that the funds are available. Available, so those need to be done before we proceed with the PAF and the um, back pay and payroll process. So I will stop there and see if. Um, our principal accountant, Brenda Sosi, if you want to add anything to my comments, um, Brenda. Mr. Chair, members of the Oversight Committee, um, how Marlinda explained the processes is correct and um, it is um, complex um, accounting work as well as um, you know really have good co coordination with you know our other partners um, like office of the controller and also office of budget and management and also department of um, personnel management so it's a lot of coordination within, you know, our internal processes. Um, I don't have any other further comments. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so Chair, so I, I will turn it back over to you um, for the time being. This should cover bullet number one and two um, in the report or on the agenda. Thank yeah, um, thank you. Uh, committee members, do you have any questions? <laughs> committee members? If there's none from the committee, then uh, chair has a question on on the vacancies. 
at the uh, shelter in Shiprock. Do we have any prospects, applicants, that uh, perhaps are going through the background checks? I know that uh, the Navajo Nation has established a very complex and con convoluted system to where um, it makes it hard to put essential staff on the payroll. Do we have any applicants that are undergoing the review? Uh, Chair, so this is Marlinda. Um, again, I will respond and then also um, I'll also give some time to Trudy to provide an update as well. Um, so a couple months ago, I don't recall the specific dates. Um, we did do a job fair um, in the ship at the Shiprock chapter, and our main focus was to recruit for the Northern Treehouse. Um, I would like to say that uh, we were successful as we did receive um, some applicants and um, and because DPM was on site with us at that job fair, so they were able to do assessments and um, we were able to get the referrals right away. Um, I know, um, and Trudy can speak to the interviews that were conducted and the selection. And yes, the individuals that were selected are going through the background check. Let me give some time to Trudy to provide further information. Trudy? Thank you, Merlinda. Thank you for the question, Honorable Chair So. Um, well, I did conduct an interview on November 10th last month. I interviewed seven applicants for the victim witness advocates in the Tripura area. On November 15th, four of the applicants were selected. And at that time, they were informed to start their background check. And on November 12th, on 21st, I had interview five applicants for the residential caseworker positions. And those positions are the shelter positions. And on November 29th, I selected two of the applicants and they were also informed to start their background check. So at this time, this morning, I did do a follow-up with all the seven applicants. And I have two applicants whose paperwork is pending with the Office of Background. And then the five applicants are waiting on their um, background check from IMS, which is the Information Management Section. So they're waiting on that. Once they get that, they can submit their packet to OBI. So I'm hoping by next week, if possible, I have all seven at OBI, and then we can just wait for a favorable background clearance. So that's my um, update as far our, as our um, vacant, position, uh, sorry, vacant position. Thank you. Thank you, Trudy. We'll turn it back to you, Chair So. <clears throat> thank you. Um, thank you, Ms. Littleman and uh, Ms. Sosi. Committee members, any further questions? On um, there being none from the committee members, the chair would like to ask, uh, do we have a date where the folks that are have missed their payroll checks, do we have a possible date when they would get paid? I know that I got texts that said <clears throat> they're having to ponder um, family heirlooms to kind of able to provide for their family members during this uh, Christmas period. Uh, yes, Chair, so um, this is Marlinda. Um, is Regina, are you on the line? Uh, 
Okay, earlier, um, Regina. Yes, I'm on the call. I'm okay. sorry, I was trying to unmute myself here on the phone. <clears throat> so, yes, this is um, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. This is Regina Yazi. Um, as of, to answer that question, as of this morning, my HR, Ms. Um, Shirlene Largo, had confirmed with payroll that the employees that were whose payroll is affected is um, their PAFs and the automation ha has been processed as of this morning and they will be getting their payroll next week. In addition to the other 20, let's see, 29, in addition to the 10. So all 39 employees will be getting their payroll next week. Mr. Chair. Thank you for that update, committee members. Any comments or questions? This is Delia Slater, can you hear me? Oh, it's a little Vice Chair Slater, you have the floor. So is there not gonna be a special check run for them? And since we'll be getting paid next week, how many weeks will that be without pay? Mr. Chair and Delegate Slater, we did submit our request for special payroll run. Um, we do have, I believe, payroll is on the phone. They can better answer as to um, a decision on that. But we were told as of this morning um, that is not going to happen. Um, so we were just basically told that the 10 well get their payroll next week in addition to the other staff. So if payroll's on the phone, maybe they can speak to that, but um, that's as far as we know. Chair? Thank you. Uh, Vice Chair Slater, do you have follow-up? But, oh. but let me go to, yes, let's go to uh, Honorable Juanita and then back to you, Vice Chair. Uh, so, Tzile, um, Edison Juanita. Thank you, Chair and members of uh, the committee. I uh, uh, agree with uh, Vice Chair. Uh, what are you saying? Because I'm always concerned in reference to family services. Uh, there was problems. More employees had problems with the general wage assessment. Now this, and uh, I just really get concerned about the management. Why is it always that program? And uh, I really feel for those employees, especially right at this time during the holidays, have to, like you said, oh, and I need to say, and I call it, oh, I see it, I don't wish to eat it, I see. They thought I'll go eat it, but I was for this, so I think it's right when we started the, the 24th council, as we got on the HES, we've been going through this with certain programs. Uh, family service has been one of them, and I kept uh, you know, I was, uh, I hate to keep uh, stating, you know, my concerns when it comes to the management. Hey, I don't be at these students in chair. Thank you. I can't tell it. Honorable Wanika, uh, back to Honorable West Chair Slater for the follow up. Thank you, Chair. Um, my, well, I had a second part of the question, and that was how many weeks in between pay periods will this be for those employees? And then second, if the program can elaborate on what was the issue in the processing of their you know, payment paperwork. Like, 
I had received some sort of correspondence that said there was an issue with the Office of Management and Budget and that they had goofed somehow and that that had hurt our employees. So I guess I'd like an elaboration because as the oversight, we need to know what was the cause of the error and why our employees are really being hurt at what should be a very joyful time of the year. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. So, Vice Chair Slater, Ms. Littleman, and Ms. Begay. Yes, this is Marlinda. Um, I will respond to um, the the initial. I I don't know if I would call it an issue, but I guess how this whole started. I'll briefly uh, mention it, and then I'll turn it over to Brenda to further elaborate. Mm -hmm. um, so, so from the updates, um, the division and Department of Family Services, um, they did prepare a budget, uh, went through the whole process, and we got a transmittal letter from um, OMB. And then um, later, um, the transmittal letter was retracted. Um, and we needed to, we were instructed to uh, make amendments. And by doing so, we had to go through the whole process again um, to, to get an updated transmittal. So that's my response, but I will have um, Brenda further um, provide clarification. Um, Brenda, go ahead. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, uh, this is Brenda Sosi. The um, explanation by Melinda is correct. Um, there was a, an error that we had to create um, correct, and a budget revision um, was replaced with that. Um, while we receive a modification, when I say modification, we had received additional money from DIA. So when that happened, um, we have budgeted these positions, but the purpose of um, the, the funding wasn't for salaries, it was for operating. So um, we had to reverse the entry and then replace it with a budget revision. So that was where the correction was made. So that, that, that caused the, um, the delay in payroll for last pay period ending. Although we quickly um, worked on it, um, or I did from here, then OMB and also, also Office of the Controller, but we didn't meet um, the, I guess the payroll run in time. So um, with the updated PAFs and whatnot. So that's the reason why um, that was delayed. Okay. Thank you, Brenda. Um, and so as far as the question about how many weeks, um, I know that they did miss a payroll. Um, and I, I think that would be better answered by the program or by um, payroll. So I'll, I'll leave that um, response to, to those two. Thank you, Chair. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, staff, are you on to respond? Hey, Lee, you in there. Miss Regina Yazi, is it? Mr. Chair, yes, this is Regina Yazi. Um, yes, the one payroll was missed, and again, um, <clears throat> the payroll will be, again, I'm not sure if payroll OOC is on the call, but they are the better people to answer on, on the 
on our request for the payroll run for this week, but as I stated, um, we were told that that is not going to happen until next week with regular payroll for the 10 staff that, um, that were affected. So the one payroll was missed, yes. My response, Mr. Chair. Do we have uh, staff from OOC on the call? All right, good afternoon. This is Lita Sam with the payroll office. Good afternoon. And um, I wasn't sure what they were referring to on the agenda, 39 employees. So I'm thinking there's 10 now, is that correct? Um, thank you. Um, I guess the, you know, the, the 29 is the back pay on the general wage adjustment. And then the, the 10 would be for the ones that uh, didn't get a payroll check within the last two weeks, three weeks, okay. something like that. Um, can I get a name of which one that didn't get the payroll from last payroll? I can check to see if it's um, if it's included with this payroll that we're doing the twelve sixteen. Can I get a name or the AD number of that person? Chair, that information shouldn't be shared on the phone, and the program yeah. should know that. This is bordering on the absurd now. Thank you, Vice Chair Slater. Uh, if we could. Get that listing on, and I guess, uh, Miss, uh, uh, if <clears throat> if the program and yourself could communicate and get this listing to the committee after the call, uh, that would be appropriate, and that way it's not publicly aired. Um, uh, I just <clears throat> wanted to also mention the. Um the payroll for this pay period 1216. Um, they almost missed that deadline because we started payroll at 10 this morning. And it was finally updated before 10. And we had to quickly key in those hours for those employees. And I just noticed now that those employees that were affected with this payroll, they have an end date of 12:31. Are we going to go back through the same process again? The same people not getting paid again if their assignment has an end date of 12:31:22? Miss <clears throat> Regina Yazi and Miss Littleman, could you respond to Miss Sam's uh, question? Yes, um, I have Shirlene Largo on our on the call. She will ex she will further explain. Shirlene. Uh, Regina, this is Marlinda. Uh, let me respond. Um, Chair, so yes, we will provide a listing of those. Um, individuals that were impacted by the non-payroll um, after um, um, we conclude here. And in response to um, Ms. Sam's question about the end dates, um, we are aware that the end dates are on 12-31-22. Um, and um, I think I will have Brenda respond because I may misspeak if I tried to provide a response on that. But I know that there are, um, I believe there is a budget, yes, that needs to be prepared and, and submitted for approval um, to extend um, um, the, the budget for the employees. So Brenda, if you could respond. Um, 
to the question. Thank you. Okay, um, Chair and members of the committee, um, with the payroll um, or with the contract end date for the 638 at the end of December, um, for both, um, they, they have um, programs under there, there's domestic violence, administration funds, and then also welfare. So there are, those contracts, the AFA, they are ending at the end of December. And um, we did do a contract um, request extension and that was approved. So um, approved to um, extend the contract to 12, 30, um, 1, 23. So based off of that, I am looking at the budget to see where there are savings in the accounts to carry um, the staff for at least three, um, three months. And that's what I'm working on right now. Because the um, award don't come in on time from BIA um, right at the beginning of January, so we got to look at other funds, higher funds like what I'm doing now, um, so that we can extend them and, and not have um, them miss payroll. So that's what I've been working on. And um, that's the accounting part of it. I always say accounting because I have to do, I mean, all the the budgets um, versus expenses. So that, I, that way I know my balance, I know the balances. So that's what I'm working on right now for those three programs for DFS. And it is in, in the process right now. Thank you. Chair, that is our response to the question by Ms. Sam. Thank you. Uh, so my question is, um, are you, is everything going to be updated by, we're going to start the payroll for 1-13-2023 on uh, January 18th. Um, all those assignments has to be extended because timesheets are going to be due on January 12th. I just want to give you guys heads up on the our due dates. And these due dates are on our website. Good morning. Good afternoon. I'm sorry. Uh members of the committee. She Sherlyn Largo and she I'm the ASO for DFS. Auto um, to answer Ms. Lita, I just got done preparing all the um, all the employees uh, to be extended. I work closely with I'm working closely with um, Brenda Sosi and Regina, my department manager. So Abe and Nutchen, um we're having, we're getting all these documents prepared so Brenda can start the process of the um, the budget. So everything should be okay, and all the staff should be extended into the next to the next fiscal year. The extension, Nikki. Any further? Uh, comments or conversation. So back to the committee. Any further comments or questions? Oh, back to the committee. <laughs> if, if if not, then. Uh, Let's go to a vote. Thank you for all the responses. I think we have a clearer picture of what needs to happen. And I, I guess the main thing is there's a subsequent contract award. And so that process, it seems like we'll have to be, we'll start again and hopefully 
uh, with the lessons learned in, in this contract year, then um, those items will be taken care of uh, um, in a uh, real time-sensitive time uh, manner to where uh, employees don't miss their payrolls. With AILA committee members, comments, questions? Mr. Chair? No. Yes. Um, good afternoon. This is Racita Toddy with the Department of Personnel Management. Um, I would like to prov provide a brief update regarding the general wage adjustment PAFs. <clears throat> Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, according to our records here and our log, we do have um, some PAFs with an effective date of October 1st, 2021 for the general wage adjustment that were submitted on December 6th. However, uh, we do have an issue with um, the incorrect business unit numbers for at least 25 of those PAFs that were submitted. And we do show that four were returned and that 18 were um, processed. So um, our assigned human resource um, technician, Rhinelia Bicenti, has been in communication with the staff there at Family Services. So um, the other is we do have a total of eight PAFs for um, performance step increases that are effective from June 1st through October 1st of 2021. And they are, um, they remain, they were submitted on December 16th and they remain pending due to an incorrect business unit number. So if um, the program staff can, um, get in contact with Rhinelia Bicenti, we would like uh, for them to contact her directly so that we can address these PAFs uh, and get the general wage adjustments um, process. But um, without, without their assistance in getting this corrected, um, they're, I was um, telling my staff that um, they should just return the PAFs, but I think she's trying to work with them to get this corrected rather than having the forms go back and forth. So um, that's what I would like to report. And um, the other portion is that we did receive an automation request for um, some of the employees, which um, Ms. Sam from the payroll office did um, provide an update on. Uh, they were automated, as she indicated, and so they should be included in the next payroll. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Toddy, for the update. Mr. Chair, this is Brenda Sosi. Can I add a comment? Sure, go ahead. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Um, since the business units, there were three business units that were used to back pay these um, personnel. And like I had indicated that, you know, because of contract year ending, we go switch into a new business unit and whatnot. Those were the reasons why there were three different business units that were used. So that's probably where there's a little confusion, but um, I am working um, with the HR person, Cherlene, the one that just introduced herself. And I'm working with her to look at the correct business unit and we will work with BPM to get those updated and processed. Thank you. Okay, thank you staff members, uh, we really appreciate um, <clears throat> those uh, updates. <laughs> At times, uh, the committee finds themselves being managers. 
<clears throat> and certainly we uh, appreciate the fact that it's uh, these uh, um, corrections are being put on the air as to, I guess, uh, exemplify uh, what our, uh, our our system entails. And again, it's it's uh, the result of the many um, amendments to the personnel policies and even to the <clears throat> um, aspects of uh, being accountable to the federal government through the 638 process contract processes. So with that, uh, there's no other comments than um, from the committee, then I take it to a roll call vote to accept the report. And thank you for all the staff to um, pay attention to the needs of um, these 29 and most especially the 10 that need their payroll. Thank you. Ms. Chi? Chair, roll call vote to accept the uh, report from Division of Social Services, Department of Family Services. Honorable Paul Begay, Jr., how do you vote? Green. Honorable Paul Begay, Jr., votes green. Honorable Pernell Halona, how do you vote? Honorable Pernell Halona votes red. Honorable Carl Slater, how do you vote? Red. Honorable Carl Slater votes red. Honorable Charlene So, how do you vote? I vote green. Charlene So votes green. Honorable Edison J. Winika, how do you vote? Red. Honorable Edison J. Winika votes red. Chair, you have two in favor, three opposed, and chair not voting. Chair? Thank you, Mr. Chief. Uh, again, so we'll um, again appreciate the attention, and I, I do see the, the focus of um, several programs to address this matter, and for me, that's a step forward. Uh, so, uh, Honorable Carl Slater, let me give you the floor as I think you have a request to the committee, respective of the agenda. Thank you. Thank you, Chair and committee members for the opportunity. I'd like the motion to suspend the four Chair, rules so and amend the agenda. Who is that saying, Chair So? Uh, this is delegate Begay. Oh, uh, I, I'm just. Um, I just have a question, uh, Chair. Uh, the amended uh, agenda inclu to include a report on the funeral expense issues. I I oh, yeah. Does that, does that follow this one, or does, does that come later? No, no. That should Thank have you. also been. The Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Honorable Paul Begay, that should have also been part of the uh, Division of Social Service uh, Committee or the uh, report on funeral assistance. I'm sorry, uh, Honorable Carl Slater. Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Little Man? Mr. Chair? Still on the call. Yeah. Uh, this is Angela Ibanelli. Go ahead. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the Health, Education, and Human Services Committee, on um, the amended agenda, and I did send it, and it should be posted um, on the Legislative Affairs website, and I did put Mr. Uh, Delegate Paul Begay's request under D, uh, 5D, Navajo Nation Burial Assistance Fund, non-payment to mortuary vendors. And it's regarding the non-payment to Valley Mortuary for services and also the payment timeline to mortuary vendors for services rendered, the status of Navajo Nation OOC payment to Valley Mortuary and other mortuaries, 
and the NDSS Burial Assistance with, with the Navajo Family Assistance Services, um, and then the Emergency Management COVID Burial Assistance also. And the individuals that I did email it to and did a Zoom invite to is uh, Mr. Robert Willie with OOC, uh, Rayanne uh, Batiba uh, with the Burial Assistance under the fam Navajo Family Assistance Services under DSS, and Edmund So, Delegated Supervisor at Emergency Management, and Mr. Jesse Delmar, the Executive Director for um, DPS. Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Benali. Are those folks on the call? The main individuals? Chair, so this is Marlinda. Um, I'm here on the call and also Rayan Matiba, um, Program Manager for Navajo Family Assistance Services is also on the call. Thank you. Okay, let's, uh, let's address that particular matter. Um, and then we hope the other folks join the call as you're proceeding with your report. Thank you, Chair. So um, at this time, I will turn the time over to Ray Ann uh, Matiba, who will provide um, an update on payments to vendors for um, burial assistance. Ray Ann. Good morning, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Um, so in regards to this issue, uh, please remember that the Navajo Family Assistance Services offers um, assistance to applicants for LIHEAP, LIWAP, CSBG, um, general assistance, burial assistance, and school clothing. Um, also, we had informed you guys um, in prior meetings that we are short staff as well. I have a team of, um, let's see, about 13 senior case workers out in the fields in for the administration, myself and two other um, administrative workers, support staff. Uh, we do get a quite a bit of um, financial assistance requests coming through our office on a daily basis. So we do try to keep up with all six of those programs, including burial assistance. Um, unfortunately, burial assistance payments has been quite lengthy um, in getting them paid. Uh, uh, when I came on board last year, uh, one of the concerns that I brought up is that we don't have, uh, for the invoices that we are receiving from the burial assistants or mortuaries, um, they are not providing an approved letter from a senior caseworker or an approved application, uh, which holds us back and we're having to go and find out if in fact this burial assistance request was actually um, approved by uh, any of our senior caseworkers. The other thing that we are running into is that the previous supervisor um, did not leave a lot of information on these types of um, requests, especially invoices and support documents. We also lost quite a bit of employees um, due to retirement in last year. And so, it's been definitely a challenge to stay on top of all of this with all of the work that we do receive. So we are doing our best to um, address this situation. But like I said, the main concern that I have is there is no approval notice to verify whether or not um, these were actually um, approved by our departments. So we are trying to work with the mortuaries. We are trying to go back and get them approved. Like I said, it is taking time. Um, so we are also in contact uh, with the mortuaries that do bring these to our concern. We let them know, you know, we're, we are um, short staff, we're doing the best that we can. And of course, with constant um, um, illnesses out there that my staff do catch, it does set us back uh, some time to, to get issues addressed. But rest assured, we are continuing to work on it. I have been working um, with other staff members, a few actually, um, 
after hours and weekends just to address this. And like I said, um, it's just making sure that we have all the support documentation and having to go back through um, previous um, employees, whoever we can get a hold of, uh, their email um, as well to see if, and their, their documents to see if we can find those um, applications approved as well as letter of notifications. These are things that have to be attached to the RDP and the invoice when we submit it to OOC, otherwise it gets held back and returned. Also, we're finding that some of the um, individuals or decedents listed on the outstanding statements have already been paid. So we also have to take time to go into FMIS and do research um, to see if these invoices were actually paid. Uh, we have notified some of the um, mortuaries that we're, we're doing one mortuary at a time. We've notified them to let them know that this individual or this particular um, invoice has already been paid for. So it's sort of record keeping on both ends that um, need to be um, rectified. And like I said, um, we are doing our best going forward to get these resolved. Um, so I'm more worried or more uh, focused on 2020 and 2021 outstanding invoices. And like I said, it does take time to do the research. And then I have my administrative assistant um, who is taking care of current year. And I believe that is the um, outstanding issue that uh, Valley Ridge has with the program. Um, she did notify them that there is a 90,000 payment being that's pending OOC's approval and review. Uh, my admin assistant did speak with um, Ms. Delcine yesterday to let her know what was going on. Um, so we, like I said, we are in the process of, of taking care of these matters. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Chair So, back to you. Thank you, Ms. Matiba and Ms. Lima. Little man. Um, committee members. Delegate Begay. Oh, such a honorable Paul Begay, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair, uh, Vice Chair, members of HESI committee, staff. Thank you for the presentation. Um, it, it's really kind of hard to understand or comprehend. Oh, and when it comes to the Navajo Nation. Nothing ever comes, uh, gets done in a timely manner. So when we talk about funeral expenses and services, I heard a lot of a, a more, very common phrase, time is of the essence. And in a lot of cases, we have traditional beliefs, culture, You know, we tend to put so much paperwork and things like that in front of it. Ahaki, those that oversee the area, specifically talking about funeral expenses and services, why don't they pro program their administration of services in a timely manner? So mortuaries, which are not So don't we don't run into these problems. then The social service area, Valley Mortuary, 
We don't we don't want to work with the Navajo Nation anymore. Cause oh how you bang at the field. I don't hit you now. Ileda. Junna. How do we eliminate this low process and putting uh the never baby chat na huil na but you the negin nafi na kaiko I don't have a lack you but it's it 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 is frustrating to listen to them. I know I've in the past I have helped in that area and uh, sometimes it, it I don't know that's it but in cases like this, uh, I, I think this is more uh, more recently that the decision by uh, Valley Mortuary in Chuba City has decided that they don't try to don't hit them. That should let the guy don't want to let what that they need or has the honor has let. So what do we do? They can't go to Blackstaff. An hour and a half drive away, and then Aja Yego night. So uh, we put more burdens on the people that have already that are in the mourning process. A D K is ah. Is there a way to for social services to uh, come back? to the table with these mortuaries and make some time of a specific agreement that says you will be paid on this day. So that the mortuaries can continue to serve our people. The never pay so that then go back to us at that so but down the hot desk I go has not has And Kadoi, the Navajo Nation Social Services, they are cut a Nago Hot Nigo Hotel Bahanego, a nature that is in, but yet we continue to trouble them with uh, the waiting time and uh, other things that Obajaka and that deal. So, how do we, what do we do with these? Mortuaries. How do we uh, satisfy uh, payments so that the services can continue? We have to. We do. We have to do this. Yeah, yeah. And I think tomorrow will be the fourth day for this this family that uh, that are continuing to call me. And the delegate, they, they all believe that the delegate has a magic wand that they can flash and things will happen. And offer some words of condolences and, and comfort. There are ways their social services can sit down with these people, specifically Valley Mortuary in Tuba City, and give them the, your word that they will be paid. Maybe even a specific day. It's very frustrating and disturbing and that's just you feel very helpless. You feel for the people.
Thank you for those hard, heartfelt comments. Uh, Honorable Winika, go ahead. Gazi Chair, so committee members, D. Paul, you have to eat on you with that. But as you need to know what I need to end on, then that's what you We do our best by going to the respective programs on that you come. So sometimes, uh, as a health education human service committee, as policy makers, the regular address of the I'm hoping that maybe the uh, uh, president's office is listening, so A they can address it directly. At the end, I just find that you can't. I can't know how to do that. So this is just a sentence. And sometimes you feel, I wish we had uh, more of a direct responsibility, but we can't. We're policy makers. We're not going to be able to do it. We're not going to be able to do it. So exactly like what Paul is saying, that need, something needs to be done. I don't know. Another thing that makes it harder is uh, when uh, people used to meet at the chapter, donation as it was when people used to meet. People really come through. The only thing we can rely on is on the programs. I really hope something can be done from the president's office as soon as possible. Thank you, Chair. Um. Um, <clears throat> I guess as a follow-up, did I understand that there's an outstanding invoice, unpaid invoice, to Valley? Is that what I um, basically heard? And could there be clarification? Uh, Chair, so this is Marlinda. Um, Go ahead. Thank you. Um, um, Delegate Paul Begay, Adi, um, Nihilchehuin Anigi, no, Ani, um, the Kutsa, um, family, Gibbish has Anigi, um, I, Ashini, um, um, Yenil. After this meeting, she would um, meeting that she um, Adolini Valley Mortuary Hatnigi 
Lata o miscommunication dot eight a call quite hajo hajo she um banda the need half do John she hate eight only auto um Lata D Judy policy a D hot at an hit that no da hot a big hot that in niche let a call is she a bad that who needs and only auto um delegate uh Winika um um next to ha um kodon je hinzigi um derek franklin da she a yali get nikit o need ade in hit a sign um ilia hat ne ko ishi kodo um nikhi response gi to in our coordination with the valley mortuary gi ishi um will keep him in the loop do le Auto di donation nanigi e behind ziki e ya um batahuil net net kwa e ya family gi e be bahas um donation um collected this inigi e hut a e e a be bahas um kodo e rayan banadinch ah um eshe ya di outstanding invoice um no ya had ziki eshe Kodo hajoya na hatol ne um ha um Rayan, if you could provide an update on the outstanding invoice to Valley Mortuary. Thank you. Thank you, Merlinda and members of the committee. Um thank you for your comments. Uh, Mr. Begay, I just wanted to say that as far as the bringing or promising a date of payment. Um, I really think that uh, OOC needs to be involved in that meeting. Um, there is a review process. And like I'd mentioned, there are, um, these are federal or funded um, by external sources. So we also need to keep in mind that we are ensuring um, we have all the correct documentation attached and we are approving um, the applications accordingly. So, like I said, just to keep that in mind, um, the other thing is um, um, just wanted to bring to light, we have been bringing to this committee um, the general assistance and burial assistance policy for a couple months now, um, and it had been tabled. So I think that you guys really need to um, assist us in helping to assist our, our, our clients and our people who are needing this type of assistance, we do have that updated in the policy. Um, so I guess we'll bring that before the committee soon. As far as outstanding payments, we have, like I had mentioned earlier, $90,000 in payments that are pending at OOC. And my administrative assistance is working on the um, invoices for the past couple of months. Um, this is her top priority. So we will have that um, submitted soon. Thank you. Thank you, Rianne. Um, Chair So, back to you. Thank you, Ms. Littleman and uh, Ms. Matiba. Okay, thank you. Um, perhaps a letter? perhaps drafting a letter for um, staff assistant um, to write to Valley to say, yes, we acknowledge that <coughs> we've been late in paying your invoices. Please be assured that those invoices will be paid. And could we continue the working relationship to Help our families in time of need. But not need or that, eh? Sato. It does need a relationship only at Bansa's case. Perhaps even, um, in, in, even from the program. But also, at least, uh, and the yeah. other thing, committee members, uh, though, um, Thank you for pointing out that that amendment to the policies is something that the committee needs to address. 
Asian but not shit. Miss Angelita Benali. Um that meeting next week. Uh, the regular scheduled or rescheduled meeting on that particular legislation will be on the agenda. It would, oh, that is nice to us. In, in that case, thank you, staff, for pointing out. We're willing to correct that. So those are some thoughts, committee members and staff. Um, any further comments or questions? Okay, if the um, committee would on this, um, on this. go ahead. Ms. Oh, I, I apologize. I have um, two more responses to you. <laughs> um, one, oh. the because of the um, request for the amendment to the GA and BA policy, I am working with DOJ on that. Um, so I will hopefully have um, another successful um, update soon. Hopefully we'll have it ready by um, the next committee meeting. And then the other thing is that um, as of January 1st, 2022, we did um, eliminate contracts with uh, several um, mortuaries to allow people to be able to work with other mortuaries um, within the service delivery area. Well, not specifically, but we have been doing that and it's been successful. Um, I, we've had to, we've actually had uh, more success with that, uh, with assisting people who work with other mortuaries. So um, just to kind of remind or let you guys know, give you another FYI, that we are doing that as well. We're not just working specifically with um, certain mortuaries as that was the um, practice before. So now we have it more open to other mortuaries to be participants as well. Thank you. In respect of, of that, thank you. And we do appreciate that. That was uh, another item that had been previously, previously expressed by the HES committee members. So we appreciate that. With Ayla, committee members, on this portion of the report, the chair is open for a motion to accept. Motion. Motion by Honorable Carl Slater. Do I hear a second? Uh, just second, Halona. We just got to pick on him. Do I hear a second? Second, hello now. Yeah, it lasts. it's not us. Great. Committee members, if, is there more questions or comments? There being none, then let's go to Ms. Chee, do a roll call vote. And thank you, Ms. Matiba and Ms. Littleman. We appreciate the aspects of you really trying to help in this um, these hard times where there, we're dealing with <clears throat> loss of life of our relatives. Uh, Chair Stowe, uh, that will get the guess. Oh, Che, go ahead. Uh, just very briefly before we go to vote, um, uh, any information that I can share with the family that uh, keep calling me, uh, please uh, text me or give me some information. Uh, I can have uh, our advisor, Ms. Angela Benali, relay my phone number and my email to her. Uh, or, um, uh, yeah, have her email them to you so that I can get some information to share with these people. Yeah. In addition to that, uh, I guess just the, the basic, is their application for funeral assistance approved? And, and that could be also the letter to the Valley Mortuary that this family's funeral assistance application is approved and 
the program is willing to process the paperwork for payment, that would be positive um, item that could be included to assure the family. Thank you. With AILA committee members, Ms. Chi, then let's go to a roll call vote to accept this report. Chair, roll call vote to accept the report. Honorable Paul Begay Jr., how do you vote? Delegate Paul Begay votes green. Honorable Paul Begay Jr. votes green. Honorable Pranel Halona, how do you vote? Well, we're green. Honorable Pranel Halona votes green. Honorable Carl Slater, how do you vote? Green, green. Honorable Carl Slater votes green. Honorable Charlene So, how do you vote? I vote green. Honorable Charlene So votes green. Honorable Edison J. Winika, how do you vote? Green. Honorable Edison J. Winika votes green. Chair, you have five in favor, zero opposed, and chair not voting. Chair? Thank you, Ms. Chi. What you relate on the vote will be the record. Uh, Honorable Vice Chair Slater, you had an urgent request. Thank you, Chair. I'd like to motion to suspend the four rules and amend the agenda to add legislations 253.22 and 254.22. Thank you. Mr. Chair, we can't hear you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, back on mute. Okay, basically, um, we have a motion and a second, and we do need uh, more than uh, two thirds vote of the committee to add it to the agenda. And then once added, then I would defer the presiding of the legislation to Honorable Edison Winika so that uh, we can get the committee report signed today. And it would be ready, ready for reference to NABI committee. That, those are some thoughts as we go forward. Ms. Chi, roll call vote to suspend the floor rules to add two legislation. Chair, roll call vote on the suspend the floor rules and to add on two agendas or legislations, excuse me. Honorable Paul Begay Jr., how do you vote? Delegate Paul Begay votes green. Honorable Paul Begay Jr. votes green. Honorable Pranel Halona, how do you vote? Honorable Green. Honorable Pranel Halona votes green. Honorable Carl Slater, how do you vote? Green. Honorable Carl Slater votes green. Honorable Charlene So, how do you vote? I vote green. Honorable Charlene So votes green. Honorable Edison J. Winika, how do you vote? Green. Honorable Edison J. Winika votes green. Chair, you have five in favor, zero opposed, and chair not voting. Chair? Thank you, Ms. Chi. Five in favor, zero opposed, the chair not voting. So um, let's go to the first legislation, Ms. Angelita Benali. Uh, um, before we do that, uh, Attila, Honorable Edison Wanika, let me defer the um, and make you chair pro tem. 
on these two legislations, you may proceed. I'll be voting as a member. Okay, thank you, Chair. Uh, Nali, can you read the first legislation to the record, please? Yes, Mr. Chair Pro Tem, um, you have your added um, legislation. And well, it's a tracking, you. okay, tracking, thank you, tracking number 0253-22. And it is the proposed standing committee resolution 24th nomination council second year 2022 introduced by uh, council delegate Carl R. Slater co-sponsored by um, Delegate Raymond Smith, Jr. Tracking number is 0253-22 in action relating to the Health, Education, and Human Services and Navigia Committees, approving this and supporting the Utah State Indian Child Welfare Act. The legislation does move on to the Navigia Committee that has final authority after um, the Health, Education, and Human Services Committee has addressed it. The legislation has a, attached is Exhibit A, which indicates um, references to um, Utah. Uh, also, the transmittal letter from the Office of Legislative Council to the sponsor and the five-day comment period um, was completed uh, December 20th. And uh, there were no public comments that were received and recorded. And the the uh, this particular legislation does move on to the Navigia Committee. Mr. Chair Pro Tem. Thank you, uh, Ms. Benali. Uh, legislation 0253-22. Uh, I need a motion. Motion, Delegate Daniel So. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Delegate Paul Thank you, Delegate Begay. Many members, you have uh, any questions? Going twice. Going three times. Can we have the vote on this legislation? Pro temp chair, vote, uh, roll call vote on 0253-22. Honorable Paul Begay, Jr., how do you vote? Delegate Paul Begay votes green. Honorable Paul Begay, Jr., votes green. Honorable Pranel Halona, how do you vote? Why votes green? Honorable Pranel Halona votes green. Honorable Carl Slater, how do you vote? Green. Honorable Carl Slater votes green. Honorable Charlene So, how do you vote? Honorable Daniel Iso, how do you vote? I vote green. Honorable Daniel So votes green. Honorable Charlene So, how do you vote? Pro temp chair, you have four in favor, zero opposed, and one not voting. Pro temp. Thank you, Ms. Chi. By a vote of uh, 401, 025322 passes. Uh, Angie, can, we, can you read the second legislation to the record, please? Yes, Mr. Chair and members of the Health, Education, and Human Services Committee. The legislation is the um, for tracking number 0254-22, proposed standing committee resolution 24th nomination council regular meeting 2022, introduced by Council Delegate Carl R. Slater, co-sponsored by Raymond Smith Jr. Tracking number is 0254-22 in action, requesting the state of Arizona and state of Colorado to develop in consultation with Navajo Nation and Indian Child Welfare Act to be enacted under state law. This legislation does move on to the Navigate Committee and the legislation does 
um, have attached the transmittal letter from the Office of Legislative Council. Also, the five-day comment period was um, indicates that it was posted, and the ending date is uh, December 20th, 2022. And there were no public comments that were received. Mr. Um, Chair Pro Tem, this legislation does move on to the Navigate Committee. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Benali. Um, legislation 0254-22, uh, I need a motion on that. Committee members? Motion, Delegate Daniel So. Uh, thank you. Uh, Second, Delegate Begay. Thank you, uh, Delegate Paul Begay. Uh, committee members, do you have any questions? I. Going three times. Hey, can we have a, a okay. hold on? Um. Chair, roll call vote on zero two five four hyphen twenty two. Honorable Paul Begay Jr. How do you vote? That was the Paul Begay vote screen. Honorable Paul Begay Jr. votes green. Honorable Pernell Halona, how do you vote? Hello, vote green. Honorable Pernell Haluna votes green. Honorable Carl Slater, how do you vote? Green. Honorable Carl Slater votes green. Honorable Charlene So, how do you vote? I vote green. Honorable Charlene So votes green. Honorable Daniel Iso, how do you vote? I vote green. Honorable Daniel Iso votes green. Pro temp chair, you have five in favor, zero opposed, and chair, pro temp chair not voting. Uh, with that, uh, legislation 0254-22 passes with a 501 vote. Thank you. I'd um, like to uh, give the virtual chair back to our chairman, uh, Daniel So. Uh, the chairman. Oh, Cat Lassett, it's a great job. And, and Honorable Vice Chair Slater, thank you for bringing those. Uh, Two legislations, they are very timely and very important. Um, so with that, Ms. Angelita Banali, uh, do we have another item on reports before we conclude the agenda? Committee members, uh, I know that. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. I was reading along when I had. I thought I clicked the mute, uh, unmute button, but I didn't. Um, the committee has um, completed uh, their agenda, having received uh, reports 5A uh, from the IHS and 5B from the Division of Social Services regarding uh, Northern Treehouse Shelter. C is uh, also from Division of Social Services regarding the um, uh, payroll and um, contract services, also the wage adjustment um, status. And then 5D was uh, regarding the Navajo Nation Burial Assistance Fund. And there were two uh, legislations that were added uh, under, under seven new business. A was legislation 0253-22. And legislation and B was legislation 0254-22. And both legislations were emailed to the um, committee members, Mr. Chair. And I do have the committee reports um, almost completed. I just need to proofread them uh, for Mr. Uh, for Delegate Winnicott's uh, signature. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um... One question to our legislative council, Ms. Loya Henderson, are you still on the call? Ms. 
for Chief Legislative Counsel, Ms. Dana Bodroff. Committee members, so uh, we had received notice from Mr. Matthew So on the uh, policy that we requested while we had that uh, work session leadership meeting in uh, Albuquerque for them to amend or give us policy on the background check for um, school board members. And Mr. Matthew so had referred it to DOJ. They got the clearance to proceed with it. And uh, Honorable Wanika signed the legislation request and Ms. Barbroff had basically then text back that they'll try to get it out in a timely manner, meaning this afternoon. So, Akwagi, uh, Satilia, if you could um, find some way to stay busy while that um, draft legislation is finalized and then take it to OLS to sponsor or co-sponsor. And that way it could be, <clears throat> we could address it next week. A committee members, it, it looks like we're gonna have a special NOBI session on the 27th. And then from there, then uh, there should be a petition. So uh, whether it be the afternoon of the 27th to the 28th, then the 28th would have would be our regular meeting. But if it if the council special session goes into the 28th or the 29th, would the committee want to convene in a special meeting on the 30th? That would be a question to the committee members. Uh, Mr. Chair? Yes, Ms. Um, the uh, the uh, Speaker's Office has um, allowed a um, administrative day on that on the 30th. Okay, darn it. So we got to meet on the 30th, committee members. Darn it. <laughs> yeah, darn it. <laughs> uh, um, so if the chair committee would make us yes sir uh, honorable vice chair slater i'd say that if we need to pass the school board legislation out of the hess committee prior to it going to nabi then i'd suggest we just meet at 8 a.m or 9 a.m before the special nabi on monday and let's see on tuesday Monday. Oh, you, um, oh, I thought the special knobby was proposed for the 27th to the 28th. Okay, darn. Yes, you're right. But on the school board policies, I think. Oh, but the 27th is, is Tuesday. I, I, okay, I need to go back to school myself, I guess, and figure out how to count. <laughs> okay, Miss Loya Henderson, are you on the call? Gosh, I got to find that. Yes. Hi. Ms. Henderson. I'm here. That school board policy amendment, does that have to go to Nobby? Um, in review of the school board policy, I just um, finished it, and it is just a HESC policy um, that needs to be um, addressed at the HESC committee. Great. Thank you. We do really appreciate your timely um, work. Um, so committee members, if we need to, or I know there's now two legislations that are within the authority of the committee, the amendment to uh, that family assistance um, services. I can't remember the legislation number and this proposed uh, legislation that Ms. Henderson is finalizing. 
if we could uh, get a motion to um, meet on the 29th. And if necessary, we could start it at 1 p.m. That would motion, elegant suggestion. Okay, motion to uh, reschedule the uh, 28th test meeting to the 29th at 1 p.m. Thank you, Monica. Second by Honorable Edison Monica. Put Ayla. So uh, again, Ms. Henderson, that legislation on the school board policy, did you say you finalized it? Hi, Chair. So um, yes, I have it finalized and um, will be ready for pickup um, as soon as it's printed out. And uh, you and um, the co-chair should be informed here within the next, I would say, 10 minutes or so. Okay. Are you by chance in Window Rock rather than working remotely? Unfortunately, I am working remotely today. Fortunately for you, I guess, huh? <laughs> okay. Um, thank you. We appreciate your your work. Um, with that, committee members will vote to have us. Uh, Honorable Wanika. Yeah, that, that one on the school board. Again, yeah, I'll go ahead and sign up on that. But the other one that you said was going to be there also uh, for uh, uh, Vice Chair uh, Slater. Hey, yeah, uh, they don't have any information on that. Hey, yeah. Oh, that was, I think it was in regard to these two that we just adopted. Oh, okay. So it's yeah, just the one. That, yeah, the one so it's on just the one. Area. All right, oh. I'll go ahead and uh, wait for that. Oh, Koshila. Any other discussion, committee members? So let's vote on rescheduling the 28th meeting to 1 p.m. on the 29th. With a little... Committee members, we have a motion and a second. Ms. Chi, could we have the roll call vote? Chair, roll call vote for his committee meeting on the 12th, December 29th, 2022 at 1 p.m. Honorable Paul Gay Jr., how do you vote? Honorable Pernal Halona, how do you vote? Honorable Pernal Halona votes green. Honorable Carl Slater, how do you vote? Green. Honorable Carl Slater votes green. Honorable Charlene So, how do you vote? I vote green. Honorable Charlene So votes green. Honorable Edison J. Winika, how do you vote? Green. Honorable Edison J. Winika votes green. Once again, Honorable Paul Begay, Jr., how do you vote? Chair, you have four in favor, zero opposed, and one not voting, and chair not voting. Chair? Thank you, Ms. Chi. Thank you for putting the vote on the record. Um, committee members, the chair is open for a motion to adjourn. Motion. Motion by Honorable Vice Chair Carl Slater. Second, Winnie Thank you, Satilla. Um, great. Um, so that motion does not take uh, a uh, any discussion. So let's go to um, roll call vote to adjourn. Yeah, roll call vote on adjourn. 
Adjourning. Honorable Paul Begay Jr., how do you vote? That was a Paul Begay vote screen. Honorable Paul Begay Jr., vote screen. Honorable Pranal Halona, how do you vote? Yes. <laughs> Arnold for now, Halona votes green. Arnold Carl Slater, how do you vote? Arnold Charlene So, how do you vote? I vote green. Arnold Charlene So votes green. Arnold Edison J. Winika, how do you vote? Green. Arnold Edison J. Winika votes green. Once again, Arnold Carl Slater, how do you vote? Green. Honorable Carl Slater votes green. Chair, you have five in favor, zero opposed, and chair not voting. Chair? Thank you, Ms. Chi, for putting the vote uh, record on the call. Hey, Honorable uh, Vice Chair Slater, are you on the call? I just got text from friends in Jerusalem, and they're sending prayers and their love. In the background is the Kotel, the Western Wall. I thought I'd just relate that to you. And to wow, all that's the, really special. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, Do so, toda, as we say, that is great. Mm, great. Thank you. Um, committee members. Um, Please be safe on the road as you go to the um, function tomorrow. I will not uh, be going. I'm staying close to home. I'll be um, <clears throat> being basketball che um, for the next few days. So to all have a very wonderful um, holiday period. So. I know today is the summer solstice. Uh, no sun, not uh, no. Hello, uh, Jonah. Jonah ate on the Sakhat Nisha. It is a special time, special time for prayers and for se sending love to all and to be gathering around closely. As a committee, we've really pushed forward on many, many major issues. And I thank the committee for being a solid group. Have a happy holidays. Stay safe. Be well. Cherish your loved ones and family. Take care. Take care. Thank you all. Thank you.